And we are live with episode 4,900 and something of Talking Tough. I don't know, guys. We've done a lot of shows. And uh, I'm here with my good, good friends, Boss Rutten and Butterbean. What's up, guys? We Having I'm a great good. week. Having a good week. Man, everyone's having a – I think everyone's in really good spirits today. No one's bummed out. Uh, no one's sick. We have a, a guest on today who had very high energy um, and is doing great in life. So that's nice. I know, boss, you're you're back from Europe and getting to go home. You got stem cell therapy, but let's save that because I saw you and our guest, Kasim Osgood, texting back and forth about that earlier. So it'd be good to talk about that when he's on. You know, and as a three-time pro bowler in the NFL, he probably has some experience with that too. Um Butterbean, I know, continues to crisscross the U.S. in his RV, killing the convention circuit and getting ready to join Diamond Dallas Page in uh, Atlanta to become the fittest human being in the U.S. Looking forward to that. Um, guys, and I'm doing good. I'm heading, uh, I'm leaving my dogs tomorrow. I hate that. I already miss them. I already want to cry about it. But I've got a week in L.A., big parties. I've got a couple of hot dates, which I'm excited about because I don't do anything here on Maui. And, uh, a lot of good business for Cameo, so good stuff. Awesome. Yeah, I'm just right now, I'm just trying to get caught up and get everything lined up so when I'm gone for three months, that things will run smooth. Jeez, three months. How many episodes is go, they're going to be? I really don't know. I, I don't know. how they, they, they kind of leave you, leaving me in the dark on how exactly how it's all going to be laid out and day-to-day -day activities and all that. They're kind of leaving me in the dark. I think that's a big part of being on a cast for unscripted television. They like want to give you a basic idea, but they want to catch like those surprise reactions and like in the moment. So it's not rehearsed and whatnot. And that's no, kind of what makes it fun. Too. It'd be a good idea. It'd just be a good film to kind of have an idea of the, the way the show was going to go. You know, yeah. what they had planned. I know we're going to do yoga. But other than that, we don't. I don't have no no clue what you know. There's a lot of, a lot of time and day to go through for not knowing what's going to be done. I would have never those, expected DDP sorry. yoga on that show. I would have never expected that. No, nope, no, nope, absolutely <laughs> not. You know, and, and for those who are watching who are not sure what we're talking about here yet, um, Butterbean is leaving his home in Alabama to join Diamond Dallas Page at his home in Atlanta, and is going to be part of an ensemble cast for an unscripted series where Diamond Dallas Page is going to remake people's fitness. And he's really good at that. You saw it in the resurrection of Jake the Snake. Um, Diamond Dallas Page is a master at that. Butterbean, I think, is going to be the greatest character DDP has ever worked with. The two of them together are going to be magic. And more than that, Bean, I'm just looking forward. I want to see the spectacle. But on a personal note, I'm looking forward to see what this does for you. It's going to be amazing. Well, apparently there's going to be five other people, so I'm hoping. You know, I, I just hope I get along with everybody, and it's it's a good, it's a good flow with everybody. You, you know, it's it's good to be you, uh, Eric, because you know if so, if you don't like somebody, you can still knock them out. You see, that's the good thing about being a fighter. Nobody will have cost problems with you. I can guarantee you that already. And with the whole background from being a professional athlete. You know really how to push. I think that's going to help you a lot as well. Yeah, I think so. I mean, having the drive is going to help me a lot. Yeah. And, and I don't know if you saw there, Clown Man was already congratulating you, which I think is great. I think people are going to be really excited that uh, that you're doing this. Diamond, uh, Paige called me today. Dallas Page called me this morning because he asked for a clip from the episode that he was on where Flex, Flex Wheeler, was pushing you uh, or pushing you to Paige to bring you on his show. And uh, Paige wants to include that in one of the episodes. So he's really uh, it's excited. Good, it's, good, it's, a good, it's a good call for Diamond to have me on the show. I really think it is. I think it's the best thing that he could do. I think for from all the people, if I think about it, you, you're the freaking perfect model, the blueprint for it. I truly believe so. I think a lot of people are going to watch that because – your love, man. You know that everybody knows you, and uh, and and they would love to see that, and they want to see you succeed as well. So, it's going to be a great motivation for you. You know, from having a hard time getting around to be able to get up, and get around where I want to is going to be. It's going to be a big change in my life, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's the way to go into it, man. Have you watched that Arthur video by chance? The Diamond uh, Dallas Page Arthur. Times, yeah. Kurt Boss, have you seen that? 
No, I've seen a bunch of stuff, yeah, from them. That's it's it's crazy transformation. You mean the hip hop guy or which one was it? No, the, the, the guy, the ex, uh, the, the veteran who was he like was a 400 pounds. Sorry, Bean, go ahead. Set tone. He was yeah. a parachuter. And oh. he injured himself on, on, you know, on some of the jumps. That was the first guy he had, right? That made him yeah, big. So. Yeah, yeah. That was the first. Amazing. Yeah. It's the one that put DDPY on the map. Yeah, this guy, 400 pounds, couldn't walk anymore. I mean, just in horrible condition. And at the end of the video that went viral, the guy's doing wind sprints. He looked like yeah. a different person. It was amazing. Yeah, he was walking on crutches. I mean, he was, he was a different guy. He was half the size now, less almost. I mean, how many pounds did he lose? It's got to be in his over to one. We lost 170, thing, I think. Yeah. We lost a lot of uh, – me, I mean, I know I'm going to lose some more weight because I'm back on, you know, my, my regimen where I'm dropping three to five pounds every week. I mean, I'm doing really good now. So the weight loss is not the factor. I think just getting up and be able to do learning how to do the yoga and be able to move around and get more flexible is going to help me a lot. Yeah. Well, you're going to have That's to stretch your move, you know, when you grab your foot and you're going to stretch the leg out. We want to see you do that in three months. <laughs> no pressure. And, and, a, and a wind sprint also. Don't forget the wind sprint. Fair enough. All right. right Good on, deal. Man. Well, guys, we have um we, we have a, a guest on today that you know I'm excited about. I barely know this guy. I've talked to him just twice. Uh, we had a great conversation. A really sharp guy. Um, he he's at the top of his game. He's a uh, an, an ex NFL player, three times to the Pro Bowl. That uh, in and of itself is a, a pretty incredible feat. Um, I know, like many of our friends and some of us, he uh, came up from a bit of a rough background and uh, absolutely came out the other side of it. And I think it's uh, time we uh, bring him on and put him on the firing line. Our bring guest today, on. out of California, is Mr. Kasim Osgood. Kasim! Boom! Oh! Do we have volume? Kasim is on mute. Ah, ah, there there you rookie mistake. There you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> rookie mistake. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, hazing. <laughs> Kasim, yeah. how are you doing, man? Thanks for joining us. I'm doing great, man. I appreciate the offer to, to come on the podcast, man. This is a good time for me to be able to get away from the two young ones. I got a four. Ooh, how old are they? A three-year-old and four-year-old. Whoa, the terrible twos are just behind you, but still, now they're over. Oh, a little dangerous, yeah. Boys, you know, girl? You know, you know, what? I I know why he's bald headed with two toddlers running around the house. That's what happened to my exactly. hair? Exactly. Yeah, I've I've been telling people that they didn't believe me. Said, oh no, it's hereditary. No, it's kids. Trust me, it's kids. It activates. Exactly. Are, are there boys or girls? Or you got one of each? Uh, my three year olds a boy and my four year olds a girl. Wow, very cool, man. That is crazy. Uh, is the uh, is is the girl? Is your daughter beating up your son? Uh, she was until I uh, I explained to her that he's going to get bigger than her one day. So then I had to sort of teach her how to mold him into being a gentleman so he takes care of her. Yeah. At, at, four, yeah. at four years old, did she get that concept? Oh, 100% because she switched wow. right away. She started being really nice to him and sharing stuff. She's like, okay, now because when I'm sharing with you, you have to share with me now, right? He's like, yeah. 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 Oh, good uh, job, yeah. man. I'm training him good. Maybe, yeah, maybe yeah. you can. Maybe you can train me and Boss and Butterbean to be nicer to each other. Hey, man, I know Boss. I, I grew up watching Boss and Butterbean. These guys are, are legends in my book. I mean, we have that Boss rooting machine has been in there. I've watched my brother every day for years. Beat the crap out of that thing. And this is the big guy. He's bigger than me. Yeah. He beat the crap out of the machine, and it's still standing. You know, it's, so, and that's what all the people say because, you know, when they see me hit, they think, oh, it breaks. I broke two of them, and this is over a course of like nine years. And I kicked the freaking hat. Yeah, so, I see the commercial. That's why we bought it. <laughs> nice, I love it. That's well, always good to hear. Very cool. Boss, are those still available, boss, for sale? Yeah, yeah, they're on uh, bodyactionsystem.com. Body action systems, systems or system? system without an uh, with the RTS, no plural. Bodyactionsystem.com. We'll put that on the edit afterwards, so it's uh, on the crawl. Um, how much do they cost? I have no clue. They're like, uh, awesome. yeah, no, because there's all different types that you can do. Like I have a, I use a simple, I have the hat, the body pad, and the body pad is what it does. It has shapes on it. So if you hit the, the left hook to the body, the liver shot, in the shape that the pad is angled, you hit the perfect punch. Then you have a solar plexus aim, and you got also a spleen shot. 
And then the head bounces like a real head. So you can make really fast combinations, but it's always there, but it moves. And then the, it's it, it's a thin, how you say it, frame, but it, it takes that, it needs to be thin because it takes all the power. It absorbs the power and that's why it works so well. And yeah. uh, so I have the simple one with two hands on the side as well. So you can hit those things. And normally I would tell the people kick that because if you kick the head, you need to have good technique because if you drag a kick through, you know, so you can break anything, you know? So you have to make sure that you pull the kick, of course, and that you make it a nice kick. But otherwise, just kick the, the focus mitts on the side. But there's people also that have the focus mitts below, so you can low kicks. You can do that as well. You can build it out as crazy as you want, and it goes up and down in every size. It's uh, it's pretty cool. But I think they're around 300, 300 bucks. That's not bad at all. Yeah. Um, you know, oh, there it is right there on our screen, bodyactionsystem.com. And for those who didn't get it, body, B, action, A, system, boss. Boss, body action system, obviously. That's crazy. Um, now I, geez, that's the first time I find that out. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Sure. Yeah. I'm going to get one. I just got a treadmill for my house. I'm going to get that next. I'm glad you glad to hear it's uh, available. Kasim, have you worked on that machine before, or you just watch your brother beat it up? Oh, I did all the time. Uh, in off seasons, it's, it's, it's a great tool that crosses over from different sports. Not only is it from uh, fighting, but also in football. There's a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat that we use. So, I mean, they're, they're great. Uh, points of emphasis for aiming and breaking down the body parts in order to to get past the uh, defensive back from playing receiver or dodging a, a blocker from tackling somebody. It's wow. really, really versatile. Yeah, I, I heard about the NFL players because I was at the 49ers one time and uh, doing a talk for these guys, and they were talk they even work with sumo wrestlers because of their low gravity and how to move and how to be the strongest, you know, especially for linebackers and everybody. Yeah. So they they work with all different kinds of athletes. You you guys hire everybody pretty much, right? Yeah, uh, the interesting thing about sumo wrestling is that it's this is from the most smartest guys that have adapted their body to angular momentum and physics and vectors. So yep. It's so scientific, the technique of, of being a great sumo wrestler, that it doesn't matter how big you are. If you have the proper angle, there's angles that you can't beat just mathematically that are impossible to defeat it. And those guys have mastered it. It's amazing to watch. You know, I had this really cool thing that was that the number four of Japan was a big fan of mine. He would always come to the fights. And he one time he invited me to go to the dojo. And I remember it was, I believe, five stories up. And we, I, and I asked, I said, of course, I said, can I bring my other fighters as well, the guys, because they would love to see that, you know, we would love to see your train. He said, sure, bring everybody. So we went up with like seven guys or so. And then this guy opens the door and he could be like 450 pounds. And he's, oh, very nice meeting you. Follow me, he says. And he starts sprinting up the freaking stairs. And I, I'm not lying, when we are on the top, it was like we were more out of breath after wow. five stories than that freaking guy because he had to do that every day. And that training, dude, you get a whole new respect for these guys. They're, you think, oh, they're just fat guys. They're not. The, the legs have zero fat. They're yeah. giant. Uh, there's, there's oak uh, tree trunk where they, they hit them. And you see the handprints in there. Like over time, there's just dented in the freaking bog. Then when you get up the, the, the floor to train, they have like also a tree trunk sticking out there, like the, the round part. And every time before they go up, they kick that thing with their shins. I don't know what the thing is, but they kick it as a freaking fighter, like hard. I couldn't kick it like that. Like, bam, bam, and then they go up that stage and go, dude. So they train five hours, and then they eat five hours. I had one bowl. Uh, oh. Finish, and they would eat 11 of those freaking balls. And while they're eating, they're combing their hairs. They have the, the young boys there. They have to do everything for them. And believe it or not, they can't wipe their own butts. So the young boys going to have to wipe the butts for them. Wow. Dude, I had to blow my nose. That's a big honor. It really is. It's a big honor in Japan. It's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, it's the number one guy. You see, but you know, I, I asked for uh, the food, by the way, is all healthy food now because in the past they died like at 32, 35 years old. Now the life expectancy goes over 50 because of course, all the cholesterol in the past. Now it's all healthy food. Yeah. But I remember I had to blow my nose and they scream at this young boy and he comes back with the, with the fingers like this and a roll of toilet paper on there and I could pull it up. It, dude, it was a crazy, uh, a crazy thing to see. Crazy respect for these guys right now. Akabono was like oh. almost 700 pounds, and he could do the full split. Yeah, dude, they, these, all these kids, they all lay there in the splits. I mean, it's the same how limber they are. But you see it when they lift their legs, right, at the beginning. 
Yeah. They go all the way up. The only thing you have to do is stretch the leg. They can literally kick you in the head. I sumo in Japan one time. I sumo Bob Sapp. Oh. <laughs> yeah. it was a charity, charity sumo wrestling event. Who won that? So I can at least say that I've done every kind of combat sport there is. <laughs> That's fantastic. What happened in the what happened in the sumo match with you and Bob? Did you destroy I him? So I didn't do so good. <laughs> I would think you would beat Bob Shout. Now, how is it that Butterbean never fought Akabono in Japan? That would have been a good one, man. Yeah. Yeah. Fight. Me and Sap was lined up, but he backed out. Yeah, Bob wasn't gonna fight you. I knew that. I, I talked to him about that a bunch of times. That's Bob's great guy. Good. He's a good friend. Kasim would have been good in the prize fighting championships. I enjoy the way I look way too much. I have <laughs> a lot of oil of Olay to this face. No, no, my, my hat's off to you guys. I mean, uh, I've always respected uh, the sport of, of, of mixed martial arts. It's something that you have to have been doing since the beginning. It has to be like when you first start walking, you start kicking. You know what I mean? So it's one of those things where I think if you're going to be the best at that, it has to be something you specialize from day one. And for me, I, I got into football. Football was the, the first love. And I dedicated my life to, to playing that and perfecting it. That That's where I could kind of take out the, uh, the prize fighting energy there. But I have to have the hell of it. I do, I do like my face, the way it looks. Yeah, but you, that, that, I, I think it's all uh, – we were talking, I think, that about it last week or the week before, the last time I was on. You know, with the football – but they say, what is football, rugby or football? But it's it's football. And they say, yeah, but they have one protection. Yeah, but because of that, that you get ranked way harder than you get in rugby. Because in rugby, you're going to break a bone. You're going to break something. So they cannot go full out. But with the protection, that makes it interesting. Because then you guys figure 40 yards or 60 yards, four seconds, like a crazy, crazy number. And a guy like that running into somebody, yeah, that's going to cause some damage. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's, but also, football players are doing really good. I mean, Matt Mitrione, Brendan Schaub, you know, they were football players. And I think you guys are incredible athletes. So I think it's easier for you guys to go into a martial art than for some other uh, pro athletes. Yeah, it's, uh, I, was, uh, when I was young. I remember I was 18. I first met Chuck Liddell. I was, uh, I was a freshman at Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo. And I was over at school kickboxing. He was doing a demonstration on how to do leg uh, leg kicks properly. I remember putting my leg out there for him to kick the pad. They want to demonstrate on me. And I, I was at 18, so and I was just trying to figure out how to form muscle on my body. <laughs> kick my leg. And I remember going to off-season workout uh, that week, and I could, couldn't run. The coach said, what the hell happened to you? So, uh, you know, so I was doing a little uh, demonstration and got hit. <laughs> and, you know, he's like, come on, what's good? you got no fight at the bar, huh? I was like, no, nah, this guy named Chuck Liddell kicked me. <laughs> and the time, I was like, well, why'd you say something? I was like, because it was a part of a class. So what are you doing going to get your – you paid to get your ass whooped? And he's skid lying. <laughs> but I remember the whole week I had a lump in my leg that was so thick in there. And it was through the shield. It reminded me that, hey, man, uh, yeah, it was a shield, too. He's like, hey, this is not what you're supposed to be doing. So just stick to football. Get your uh, <laughs> iPads in there. You're good to go. Yeah. Uh, I got a lot of respect for the, the, the technique and the power and, like, the the speed of, of people. Like, I, a lot of people say, well, I can get in here and do that. It's like, I, in my own mind, I say I probably could do it, but I have to train a whole lot, but I'm not just going to jump in here and do it because I got a lot of respect for it. Well, you're, I mean, you're, you're at the very, you're at the top of one of the highest sports in the world. So you obviously understand what it takes to compete at, at any real level. How, first of all, how, what are your stats? What's your height and weight? Um, 6'5", 240. Jeez. 6, 5, 240, which is a good size for a fighter. Great stats for a fighter. Actually. Yeah. Um, I mean, you're long. There's a lot of target there, but that, that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I told myself if there was and one I'd pick, it'd be Muay Thai. That would be the one I'd want to stay in that area and kind of use range to yeah. break and, and block and show up that little shield right there. Did you, your, your, your brother, uh, Trayton and Kevin, is that, they all the brothers? Were, did, they, did they do everything uh, in martial arts afterwards? No, my uh, older brother, uh, Chan, uh, he's a um, correctional officer down in San Diego, but uh, he's also a uh, boxer. So he was doing um, semi pro boxing. They had like a. Um, Battle of the Badges boxing circuit that he was uh, a champion of at one time. So he was doing a lot of boxing. He still trains uh, to this day, but he, he just he, this boss rooting system is that's his baby. <laughs> Every oh, day I love it. he spends more time with that thing than, than anybody. And then when the dude 
called the O2 trainer. <laughs> it helps with your build your lungs. That's what it needs now. It needs to buy one of them. Oh, I'll I'll send you one, uh, Kasim. There's a be um. I invented this this uh, muscle training device for your lungs. It's uh, well, we talked about it before on this show, so we'll uh, we'll stay with you. But yeah, I'll I'll send you one, and uh, you should really do that because it's really going to change you. Especially if you do, if you do for a month straight, it's only four minutes a day. Yeah, then you, you don't think you're ever going to stop anymore because it, it it's it's that effective. It's pretty crazy. Oh yeah, I understand that when you um when you retire from playing, you know, when you retire from the the height of of competing. Your, your levels, automatically you get distracted with other things in life and you don't train the way you used to train when you were paid to do it. Yep. So I noticed a, um, a degradation in my sleep, my sleep patterns and oxygen I'm getting at night. And I know it's a, it's attributed to my, my lack of training during the day of uh, getting the maximum oxygen in there. So that, that thing will definitely, I would love to join, try it. You, you think with two toddlers, you sleep like a baby. Yep. Yeah, it's a big difference. You're going to get you, the, the, the chances that you're breathing wrong is 95% because 95% yeah. of people breathe wrong. I was breathing wrong. Everybody does. So just it forces you to correct breathe, and that means you're going to get up to five times more oxygen in your body. Yeah. And that, that's a big difference in everything, in healing and coming back from COVID to nowadays. A lot of people are raving about yeah. that. So, yeah, I, I think you're going to like it. I'll send you one. Yeah, I remember once once I started hearing about COVID, I got on that treadmill and I was running. I told my wife, I said, look, I'll outrun any virus there. I'll just start sweating it out. It's going to come out. Did you see? And, and what was that on TV? Where did they say, hey, be healthy, take your vitamin E, take your vitamin 3, 3, and zinc? You know, they're always talking about masks and all that stuff. Go out and train and be healthy, you know. That's, right. that's the best weapon against it. That's what I thought. Hey, at the end of the day, we all know now that all it is is about your body fighting it off. Yep. No matter what. And so, okay, so back, back to the football reference, you, you you hit the heights of that profession. You played in three Pro Bowls. I mean, that that's major. Would you mind walking us through, like, walk us through your football journey? Did you know you were to be an NFL player? Was it something you just dreamed about? How did you get from a kid in Salinas to being a three-time Pro Bowler in the NFL? Your brother told you that you were going to be one, right, in the NFL, I read. Oh, from day one, Yeah. I was, uh, I was the youngest of four boys, and I have a younger sister as well, so that's how I kind of maintain my humanity. But being the youngest of four boys, I was always the one that got picked on or beat up the most or you have to go and do this or take the blame for this or we're going to kick your ass, something like that. So uh, I just took that on and said, you know what, I'll, I'll be my brother's keeper, and I'll prove him wrong by being the biggest one out of everybody. And they continually encouraged me. My brothers loved me to death, but they were always hard on me so for playing football on the concrete it didn't matter if, if I didn't have a shoulder pads on. They were grinding me into the dirt, telling me to get up, calling me weak, all that stuff, just testing my character continually from just that. I mean, they took um, they took sibling rivalry to the next level. It was either you're going to you're going to either start winning or we're going to make fun of you. And if you get second, we're going to make fun of you. So either you win or you get made fun of. And if you get made fun of, it's it's relentless. <laughs> Everybody knows that growing up how that is. And um, I remember when I was uh, 11 years old. I wanted to play tackle football for the for league for Pop Warner. My mom was like, you, you play enough with your brother. It's not the same. Mom, I need to go play organized with people my age so I can I can win and, and dominate. And she's like, no, you're too small. You're too skinny. You're going to break bones. I don't want to hear you crying about it, blah, blah, blah. So she made me play Little League that first year. So 11 years old, I played Little League. It's not fun. I don't, I don't like it. I'm standing around, just being tall, wiry kid, like, Baseball is not for me, and I had a horrible swing. I couldn't swing for nothing. But I could steal a base, and I was really good at playing catcher. And um, I remember playing catcher, a guy tried to steal home base. I didn't take the mask off when I got the ball, and I ran at him and, like, basically tackled the guy, but I had the ball in my hand. So after the game, the coach says, um, it's been a pleasure having you here this season, but I think next season you need to play football instead. So he, he <laughs> gave me his, uh, his cousin's number, who's, who's the head football coach for the Pop Warner team, I got on that first season, and I led the league in, in rushing yards. Um, I think I was second in the league with most tackles. Um, always getting in fights in practice, always, like, trying to run people over or trying to dominate to assert a domination. And um, I remember that year was the first year I said, you know what, I think I'm going to NFL. And I told my mom, I says, um, when I get older, I'm going to go to NFL. I'm going to buy you a home. I'm going to get you out of this city. Because we, li we live in Salinas, California. Uh, it's pretty rough up there. A lot of, a lot of gangs and gang activity and whatnot. But um, I told her, I said, I'll get you out of here. And she said, yeah, honey, that's nice. And she worked two jobs. So she didn't really know how good I was early on. She's kind of just supporting her son. Hey, I'm glad you found something. You're not out there in the streets. 
get your homework done. I'll see you after work or see you in the morning. She would get home in the morning and I'd be going to school. And um, it just always to break my heart to see my mom work so hard and not be able to be there. And I would kind of brag about what I did for that game. And she's like, honey, that's nice. She would pay attention. I know she's tired. You can see it on her face that she just wants to lay down and take a nap. But she's going to stay awake and listen to me brag about how many scores I had or this and that. And she had no idea what was going on at all. But um, I remember fast forward to high school. Um, there was one of our rivalry games, and I had four touchdowns that game. And I remember saying I was being so happy that I was being able to go home and tell my mom that I had a game that was amazing, and it was a scout there from college, and they're going to really not going to get a scholarship, so I'll get free college. And I remember as I was walking out to the gate, I saw her there, and she was crying. She's like, I finally got to see you play, and you didn't tell me you were that good. I didn't know you were that good. Everybody's yelling your name. She's like, what's going on? Like, you, you, are, you, are you shy? I was like, Mom, I know you're busy what you got going on. This is something I've been doing. You know, is this what it is? And this is what I love. And uh, I, th I think I'm going to go far in there. So she said, you know what? Whatever you need from me, I'll help you. So getting into college, um, my mom still worked when I was in college as well. Uh, my brothers already moved out. And it was just her and my sister. But she was always sending me money. And she would take care of me. And she worked in extra time, over hours, like busting her knees up. Um, she had to medically retire once I got to NFL because uh, her knees were just, uh, they're done. She just had worked herself to the bone. And um yeah, I mean, I, I helped my mom. I made sure that my mom's taken care of so she doesn't have to worry because she put did a huge sacrifice in my life for me to get there. And I always attribute the, the inspiration of my brothers who are always strong there for me, you know, make sure that I wasn't out in the streets hanging with the gang members. Um, I remember my brother buying me my first pair of Air Jordans, uh, and I know he didn't get that by just working at the uh, Olive Garden. So, you know, he just, you know, they, they worked and made sure that I didn't have to. They got me to be able to be sheltered. I was kind of sheltered from a lot of the bad stuff, and my brothers took a lot of the brunt of that. And you know, they, they kept uh, riffraff away from me growing up so that I didn't have to deal with that. And, um, yeah, I mean, it was, a, it, it was a long journey. It's not just myself to get there. And then when I got there, I was undrafted. So I, I broke my hand my rookie rookie season. Uh, broke my hand. As a receiver, you break your hand, you can't make the team. You can't catch. So I had to make it uh, playing special teams. And I remember Marty Schottenheimer, it was a make or break. I was really down on myself, uh, frustrated. I didn't get a chance to prove myself. I was going to see my dream disappear because I broke my finger. Catching a one-handed catch of all things over uh, one of their top draft picks, I caught a one-handed catch in practice and broke my hand. And I remember Marty saying, "If you don't go down and make a tackle, you're gonna have to find another job on Monday." He's like, "I love you. It's been real, but I really appreciate. It, but this is the NFL. It's either you perform now or we got to get rid of you." So I remember buckling my chin strap, going out in the field, and I was so angry that somebody was about to tell me that I couldn't have my dream anymore. And I remember I had a broken hand. It was all clubbed up, taped up, ready to go. I ran down that field like probably 15 yards in front of everybody. And I hit that guy so hard. And I remember I get up, walk to the sideline. And I come over and I see Marty Schottenheimer in tears. And Marty was, God rest his soul, Marty was a crier. People don't know that. He was one of the most fiery coaches. He was so passionate and loving. He would treat you like you were his little multi-poo. Like he just wanted to mold you and hold you like a good uh, player's coach. But he came over to me and he had tears in his eyes. And he said, I have never coached a man that could respond the way you just did. He's like, I was just giving you shit because you broke your hand, but we love you. We've always loved you. You've always been a part of the team. You were never going to lose your job. I just wanted to see the kind of character that you had. He's like, and you proved everybody in this stadium that you deserve to be a Charger. And I remember at that moment, a little weight let off of my, of my chest. But that chip always stayed there. That, that that PTSD of like almost losing my job, it was the chip that kept me all 12 years throughout my career. I always had that fear. Like today's going to be the day someone's going to tell me my dream is done and it's, it's over. And that's how I maintained throughout the years. Just try to outwork everybody. Try to be the guy that they're reliable, that they need for anything they do. If you want me to go get some coffee, how many creams you take, how many sugars you need, whatever it takes to stay. Wow, you know, man. That, that was it. great. Uh, because, Sam, I was um, – I talked to two people about you this past week. I know you know at least one of them. Uh, two of my colleagues at Cameo, uh, D Darius Fleming, who oh, heads yeah. our sports department at Cameo, and then Patrick Schiller. You know Patrick? He also played – he was a lineman in the NFL. Yeah, I know Schiller. And they both knew you were coming on the show. And here, here's what's funny to me. I mean, you, you are, like, such an articulate guy. You're a good-looking guy. You can tell you're a family guy. You know what the first word out of both their mouths were? He's an animal. I'm like, that's awesome. <laughs> that's great, man. That, that, that's a big compliment, I would say. Yeah. 
the biggest yeah. compliment Did, is if you ever turn it off and say somebody says, "Hey, that's a nice guy." So I appreciate every time. Yeah. 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 Well, they they did say that too, of course. Yes, they they, they added that to the mix. Um, did did you grow up with a father in your household? Um, we had a stepfather who uh, liked alcohol more than he liked us, and um, he didn't even I don't know how he even knew my name for I don't know how many years. He just never really talked to me, never really engaged, and if he ever did, it was because he was mad because something wasn't clean. So I had to I had to deal. I got really good at fucking headshots. Really good at it. My, I mean, it, it carried over the football so well with hand to hand comedy, just watching hands, always seeing body language. But um, yeah, we get drunk and get mad about this is not being done, and it turned into round one of the sparring match. Like, why is that? You know, your kids are are asleep. You come home, you're mad about something else, or disappointed that something's not going your way in life. Or why is that our fault? But hey, here we are, round one, and you just constantly throughout every every year, you're in and out. You're trying to deal with. Being a kid, normal adolescent stuff, dealing with people at school, dealing with the teachers, homework, figuring out if you're going to go to college or not. And you got to duck hand, head punches out of nowhere. Like it's just, it keeps you on your toes. I try to keep a positive outlook on it. You know, the, the guy worked. He always was on time in his job. Uh, he fed us. He kept roof over our head, uh, clothes on our back. It wasn't the clothes that we wanted, but hey, I, now as a, as a dog, I'm buying uh, clothes for my kids, I appreciate that he did that. But yep. it, it was difficult, strange. There wasn't really any type of, um, role model, so to speak. I had to find my coaches and uh, my older siblings. Those are the role models that they had me. A lot of teachers that were there for times where I get, I don't know why I'm so proud about something. I'll get a B in the test. And I'm a perfectionist because I have to be able to get my mom out of the situation. So everything had to go perfect. So if I didn't get an A, this was a major misunderstanding. I had to let the teacher know, what is going on with this B? Like, there's something that I did and didn't do. And maybe it was, maybe you didn't explain it right. I remember a teacher got offended that I said that. I was like, because I'm paying attention. Because there's, there's something on the line bigger than just me getting a grade. This is my life. Like, I need to be perfect in everything. And I think that was just conversation for not having the best coaching at home. Because my mom was coaching. She was damn good at it. But she only had so many hours in the day that she could monitor the development of it and then work as well. Wow. Okay. You, you had like a 4.17 GPA, right? That's great. I 4.1 GPA. Crazy man, very cool. I've, I've got a I've got a hard question for you, and I'm, I'm going to really do my best to phrase this the right way. But so you grow up in this house, your mom, and obviously she's a good mom, but she's not there very much. Your stepfather was, as you described, alcohol, and there's some violence. You have there's four young black men, boys before you were men, growing up in an area that's gang infested. How do you guys stay out of that? Um, but the love, my mom. I mean, my mom was my mom was a pit bull, but she was she was vicious and tough, and she knew how to coach right with the limited time she was given. She was a maximizer. She got ten minutes before she gets to work. You can get your ass whipped, told what to do, and told what you can't do anymore. All within that ten minutes, and she'd be able to fix her hair back right and get out the door looking good and smelling good. <laughs> my mom was real. I mean, she was on point, and I think without that that good side, bad side. We would, we would have turned a lot more violent. And then I, I think uh, I attribute to sports and after school programs and after school volunteers, like volunteer coaches, they were everything for me. I would not be in the NFL without volunteer coaches. I mean, it's just, it's impossible. Impossible to not have some other distraction just pop up out of nowhere. Walk into school, you just get beat up, and then all of a sudden you get tired of it. Now you want to join a gang so you don't get beat up anymore. It's just, I mean, every which way you're looking. And luckily I had my gang already, my brothers and their friends, always knew that I was a little different because I'll get into talking about planetary alignments and systems and gravitational forces. And they look at me like, are you going to play Madden or what? So get out of here then. You're not going to play Madden. And I don't know video games. I would just always be reading books and stuff. <laughs> but, um, you know, thank you to my brothers. My brothers were, were highly intelligent, were very street smart, and they, they kind of just shielded me from a lot of stuff. And I attribute my ability for me to get to uh, the level I got to because I've always had them as protectors. They must be really uh, proud of what you achieved, not only on the field, but in life, I would imagine. Oh, yeah, yeah definitely. When my, my brothers are, are, are great father figures. My, my nieces and nephews are some of the most respectful kids, and uh, I love it. I mean, I, I'm a good parent because I watched how my brothers have done it, and I waited till I retired to have kids. And I, I watched my brothers go in, through, in throughout the trials, and just, I mean, they were remarkable for not having their own dad to teach them, the kind of self-taught through my mom and how to be strong as a dad. And where, where's your family now? Your mom, you're taking care of your mom, which is, that's got to be incredibly gratifying. 
where, where is everybody located? Are you all close? Or are you all spread across uh, the U.S. Um, these days? So, so uh, there, everybody's in San Diego. Uh, I'm in L.A. and my mom, my brothers, and my sister are down in, in San Diego, and they're all staying with uh, my other brother right now. Everybody's uh, holidaying because after uh, COVID and all that stuff happened, uh, people's careers had to get re jump started. And he was still working at the prison, so he was able to provide shelter for people. <clears throat> Uh, a great help in the family. I mean, it's just in my family, everybody always, if everybody doesn't have it, none of us have it. So we always kind of stay together. And that's something that my mom taught us is that that unity, that, that central position is the family first. I'll bet Christmas is fun in your household. Oh man, the soul train line, <laughs> dancing, demonstrations on body, <laughs> body action. <laughs> <in my> career. <laughs> so we, my brother gets in there and starts teaching people how to hit the bag properly. It is, it's the best. Some fun times, though. Good music, good food. <laughs> Definitely good food. Where are you watching the game at this, this Sunday? Uh, I think everybody's coming over to my house. Oh, okay. Yeah, because, I, you know, there's always – we're going to watch it with a bunch of guys. It's always fun over there. So there's an open invitation. <laughs> but I know oh. you're busy. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Super Bowl's gonna be fun, man. It's gonna be a good matchup. And 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 boss and to Sim, it being don't feel excluded. You're on the other side of the country. You guys are both invited to the cameo house party, also. You know that, of course. So another option. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'll try to get somebody to come watch the kids for a little bit. And my uh, father-in-law might be able to watch the kids step over to the cameo for a minute, do a cameo appearance. There Absolutely. you go. There you go. Make a cat. Yeah. That was no journey for me, though, Rick. I think I'll pass this time. You got to give me more notice, Rick. What's up with this? Like your birthday party. I, I know. Kasim, Butterbean totally blew me off for my 60th birthday party. Can you believe he did not drive from Alabama to California for that? I can't, still can't believe that. Well, man, you know, we'll see how traffic works. <laughs> Only give me one day notice that he's having a party. So. Yeah. Then there's that. There was that too. True. And there's that. <laughs> oh man. So um. So anyway, you're. Crazy why, shit. Why oh, wait, by the way, I need to talk about the the, the stem cell thing. We were going to oh, talk yeah. about that. Yeah. So what they did. Um, they took uh, a fat out of me. This was funny because normally it takes 15, 20 minutes. It took four hours and 20 minutes to pull 60 milliliters of fat out of me. They couldn't find any. They had to go everywhere. My butt, my side, I was black and bruised everywhere. And they finally had this little bag. And this guy said, this morning, I took fat out of somebody's chin. And that was more than this. He said, and it got out really fat. So anyway, finally, after four hours and 20 minutes, they have that stuff. Then they start uh, copying your stem cells. So they're like 50, um, I think it's 50, 100 or 150 million. One of the doses I got yesterday, um, which what dose I don't know, but we, we will, if it was 50 million, they're going to still give me the under 100 million once the, this whole test is over. This is the first uh, FDA approved test with guys who got hit a lot. And uh, uh, I, I didn't get hit a lot in the fight, but of course in training, you, you get hit sometimes if you train with guys like Peter Earth and... Uh, Pedro Hizo, I mean, these are freaking animals, you know, so, and I have to say, man, I mean, there was a guy, one of the guys uh, on the, the team that we had as well, had a stutter, and three days after the injections, his freaking stutter is gone, so wow. it's like crazy stuff, so they said, you're going to get a headache, we were driving back yesterday from San Diego, where it happened, uh, I did get a headache, but I never get a headache, so I told him, I said, that's probably going to be very short for me, now it's going to be a couple hours, it was for 30 minutes, and then I start feeling really good. I slept really good. I woke up with less pain. And my focus is also much better. So if this is just a little precursor of what's going to happen, I think it's going to be very, uh, it's going to be very good. I'm feeling, I'm feeling very, very tough. Like this morning up again at 5 o'clock, working out at 6 o'clock. I was already in the gym. Just flew through everything, jumped in the starter, stretching a little bit. Had a great start of the day. And then if this continues, I'm going to be very happy. Boss, yeah. where, where do you go for it? Uh, for stem cells. That was in San Diego. They, but the, the worst part, like I said, is because, you know, I did it before with my knees. They tried it, and they pulled it out of my bones since I have almost no fat. So they put it out of your bones. But in your bones, they have like 12 times less stem cells in your bone marrow than you have it in, uh, in your 
fat. So this time they really tried to go uh, and find it, you know. So it, I have video of it. Dude, you'll see it's like this going under your skin. I mean, they suck everywhere. I mean, it's horrible when you see it. It's like a, a vacuum cleaner under your skin, and they just suck everything out. They tried to find it. It went over to my butt, on the sides of my body, my whole front. Everything was black and blue because they had to make these incisions everywhere. And, of course, give you shots, otherwise you're in pain. And then, uh, But then they, of course, started bruising up. So you didn't feel a thing. It's not about that. There was zero pain, but it just looks very weird. And it was, uh, yeah, done in San Diego by some some guy who made the copies of it. And it's good. Like a, a few friends of mine, Randy Couture did it also. I just signed up uh, yesterday, Chuck Liddell. He's going to do it as well. I said, dude, you got to do this because, you know, we all get hit a lot, you know, in training and especially in the fighting as well. So I think this will be a great thing for you. So, uh, yeah, I hooked him up because that normally that will be co cost you a lot of money. Yeah, I was just talking to Chuck uh, the other day when I was at uh, my uh, daughter's dance class. And I called Chuck, and I, he would talk. I was telling him I was going to tell him about stem cells, and he told me that he had already spoke to you about it. Yeah, so that's, why, that's why I knew you had done the uh, stem cells. See how it went for you, because I, I just became the uh, biz, uh, vice president of business development for um, Longevity Clinics Institute here in Arcadia, California, up here in LA. And um, they have um, they do uh, stem cell from the cord blood. Uh, they've done uh, as a partner. They have a master file with. Uh, Louisiana State University, and um, they got FDA approved to do it. So they're just set up here in L.A., and I don't think they really have any kind of competition locally in Los Angeles. So it's just, the technology is amazing. Uh, how they store is amazing. I mean, they were storing uh, vaccines as well because that's how that's how high up they are with their specialization there. They've got the store, sanitation, everything. It's a nice setup, but um, I know the, the value that stem cells can provide and exosome, uh, exosome therapy. It's amazing the the night and day. How do how do the stem cells help? They're basically like the younger version building blocks of you. So imagine a younger, fitter version of you getting inside of your body and, and whipping everybody into shape. And basically, that's what they do. And, and wherever you have an injury, they go to that. They know exactly where to go. And these are yeah. your own stem cells. Also, you can do also the umbilical cord stem cells. You can do that as well. And those are blank, and they, as soon as they see yours, they put, they make a copy of it, They're, so they become yours. And I did that as well over in Panama a long time ago. And yeah. I remember the person telling me um, the, who who did it. She said it's really weird. I get energy out of my fingers, and I thought it was just a weird thing to say. And then after my third treatment, because they do four treatments there in four days, and after the third treatment, I was calling my wife. I go, oh, I know exactly what she's talking about. I mean, every morning for yeah. six months, out of my toes and out of my fingers, boom, 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 like a pulse. And the craziest thing was this. I had a 215 cholesterol level, and it was just tested like a week before. And then three weeks later, after I did my stem cells, we had another test. It was 150. It dropped like 70 points instantly. It was crazy. Do you know a guy that I think would benefit from stem cell? I don't know if he's already done it or not. Would be our buddy uh, Dan Hendo. Oh, Dan he, Hendo. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Person. Yeah, I was thinking about him to reach out to him and see if he would be interested in doing that. Yeah, because him, he would, Dan's an old friend of, of, of bosses, of course, of mine. We'll be glad to, uh, if you don't know him, we'll be glad to connect you. Oh, sure. no, I, I know that. I know that since I was 19. Oh, you do? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. So, so you're, you're in this profession now. This is what you do. Uh, yeah, yeah. I what, mean, what's I, the name of your organization? Uh, it's called Longevity Clinics uh, Research Institute. It's over. And in is there a, is there a URL that we can uh, put up on the screen here? Yeah, what is the URL? It's uh, www.lcriusa.com. All right, we got that. That'll be coming up in a moment, so we'll have that on the crawl, and anybody interested can reach out. Can they get uh, connect with you there? Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah, the uh, the CEO of Ferris, he, he's a he's a guy. He's a, he was a former athlete himself, a former military special forces, and he said, "Man, if I was to go back and look at how many times I needed this on the spot, he said I'd probably still be doing what I'm doing." So thank God that he has a clock of his own. But we're able to go back in time and fix some of the damage, and go back and kind of get some redos and reset buttons. So, I mean, I thought that was the best way to explain it. Uh, I think they're the great guys over there. The scientists over there are always encouraging people to come in and ask questions. They have a forum a room over there. For people who are kind of you know new to it and want to understand it better, they have symposiums all the time. They have uh, guest speakers come and talk. So I think I, I just love the fact that they rally behind the sports world and also the uh, the veterans and sort of they're, they're trying to inspire people to come in and learn about it so they can help. 
Is it ever too late to get started? Do we get to a certain age or get too broken down where it's just not going to help? Or is it always going to be a benefit? Well, it's always going to keep you within your range. So much like when you're going uh, to a, a casting call, you say, oh, what well, can you play this range? So, yeah, you know, I can play 35 to 45. And they'll look at you like, hey, you look like you're 54. You know what I mean? But uh, it's one of those things where you have a range that you kind of look at people like, oh, well, if I was a guest, how old you were? Probably like 50. So you're taking stem cells on a regular. Mm -hmm. It could get you at that age back to looking about 45-ish. So I say it gets you like maybe a, a five to seven range where it can kind of pull you back some years, vis visually wise. Internally, what it could do for your body, I think, is endless based off of how much damage is in your body and how much it can get you back to your reset cells. Because it's only going to replicate the cells that you have available. And that won't give you more. So yeah. you're saying that you're saying that I still have a shot at Davidson uh, Figueroa for the flyweight title then? Oh, yeah. It'll, it'll turn you back in looking like boss. <laughs> All right. <laughs> There you go. Boss Thank is you. Standard. I'm excited about that. Boss, you're going to get me ready for that, okay? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Hey, um, so I'm going to get so you ready for you're the a of, uh, the head. Of the and and Do you have any questions for them? Yeah. Um, for for Butterbean, you've always been a fan favorite. Uh, do you feel like – you've accomplished more than you put expectation on yourself or you feel like where you're at is through hard work. And I would never second guess any decision I made through the course of my career. Wow. Yeah. You know, I, I've always been like the underdog a lot on a lot of the fights because of my size. They, 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 you know, they read the, the they look at the outside of the book. They don't read what's in the book. Yeah. I tried really hard. I mean, we were training two to three times a day sometimes not counting getting up in the morning and my trainer following me on his bike and me doing my running in the cold weather. And I'm going, dude, let's do it when it warms up. He says, yeah, the other guys know when it warms up. We're going to do it when it's cold just to push you even harder. So, yeah, I mean, if, if they knew the, the, the work that I actually put in, you know, a 450-pound guy ain't supposed to be able to you know, go three rounds without breathe, breathing heavy. Yeah. Or four rounds, you know, it's just yep. – it's it's it's, it's Fighting's tough. It'll it'll wear you out quick. Who's the fighter that you always wanted to fight that you didn't get a chance to fight? I've always wanted to fight Tyson. I mean, me and Mike are friends now, but I, I think that would have been a hell of a fight. Either he didn't knock me out or I didn't knock him out, but I've never been knocked out. So, Wow. I know Boss is the guy that no one mentions. Like, oh, you, who's your dream fighter? Boss just hurts people. I think you hurt people too bad, and they've seen that, that liver punch. It's like, God. I remember asked, I was in uh, Chuck Bell's hotel after he fought Randy the first time, and we were celebrating. And I said, who would you who would you rather get hit by, boss rooting to the liver or a ape biting you in the neck? And he said, oh, hands down, I'll take the ape any day of the week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, boss, boss likes to, he likes to the liver shots, that's for damn sure. It's because it crippled me. My first Thai boxing class, some, uh, some A-class fight was my professional. He uh, and me with my karate hands here. He hit me in the head. I overcommitted, and he knew immediately that I was exposed. So he dropped me, and I was never dropped like that. I never knew what the body shot was, and I go oh, shit. And then I, um, I asked him. Of course, he said it's the liver shot. And then Roman Deckers is, to me, is the greatest guy boxer ever. Who unfortunately passed away. He started just drilling people with body shots, liver kicks, knees to the body. You know, and I go, oh, man, I gotta do this. So I start focusing on that. I don't know a lot of people do it. It's such a big weapon, and especially a little bit later in the round when people start breathing heavy, you know, because they can't really flex at the moment of impact because they're getting heavy. And if you hit somebody on the inhale when he's inhaling, yeah, that's it. You're out. You know, so, uh, yeah, that's how it came to, to, to be. But it was just me getting dropped by one. Wow. What was your favorite uh, arena to play in? I mean, the fighting. You know, there's two. And, uh, and I, I, I defended all my titles in there. That was the greatest thing. Uh, cheap Trick played in it. Live at the Budokan. Remember? I want you to want me. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and later I found out Ali fought Inoki, Antonio Inoki there. And I thought, dude, this is so freaking crazy. And that's where I won my title and I defended it against Frank also there. Yeah. Uh, I love that. And then the Sumo Arena. The Sumo Arena in Japan, I just, you know, Google it. And then look at the picture. It's it's a, such a beautiful place. And also, there they had those big trees in the dressing room for the sumo sumos. 
And the same there, all the handprints are uh, completely dented in from them hitting it. But it was just a beautiful place, everything with chrome pipes where people would sit, you know, and uh, just on the butts. That's how you would fight, uh, watch the fights there. They had these yeah. giant paintings of these big sumos over the years, those legends everywhere around. Yeah, it's really worth the, to, to, to Google that, the sumo arena in Tokyo. Beautiful place. So, yeah, those two places were the best. Right, check that out. I think I think I love fighting in Japan better than anywhere too, boss. Well, you fought also in the Cartoon Hall, right? Or oh, the small little place? In Tokyo, I fought. I, I fought in Japan probably twenty times total. Wow. Yo, B, did you fight? Because Sam, I used to corner for being in Japan, and he would fight um, in in the indoor domes with 70,000 people with Japanese yeah, legends on the show. And Bean oh, was always the most popular fighter there. Always. Oh, that's fine. People go nuts. Hey, boss, would you believe that I actually headlined a show at Corican Hall, a pro wrestling show against Hashimoto? That was my biggest thrill oh, in my entire career because I wasn't a fighter or a wrestler. So I kind of lucked into that situation and uh, headlined Corican Hall. That was pretty exciting. Dude, and if you ever go back there... That, that's that's below the Tokyo Dome there, right? And now you got the Tokyo Hilton Hotel, the, the big hotel there, the Tokyo Hotel. But if you ever go back there in the play where the Karkoon Hall is, they have a sauna. And you have to go there. I mean, the saunas there are completely the, the saunas there are so hot when you walk in, you can't just walk. You have to go really slow because Ooh. otherwise everything hurts. It's insane. And then they have TVs in the sauna. And then when you go in your cold place, you go out, you lay on the bed, you have a telephone, you get called, you can order whatever you want, food, beer, drink. You know, they come and bring it to you. Dude, it's the craziest thing ever, but you have to check it out in the steam rooms. And everything goes from hot to extremely hot. You know, you got all these special rooms. It's really a thing that you have to experience one time. I'll definitely check that out right now. Uh, I missed that so one. Said, I think it was really cool this weekend, Rick. You said I what? I was on the Tonight Show, but it wasn't really me, but it was somebody dressed up like me. Oh, yeah? Oh, yes. I, I, I saw that. Bean sent me the, the clip. Johnny Knoxville was on as a guest, and uh, the the host, James uh, Corden, was leading him through an obstacle course to get from backstage to the front of stage. And things were flying up then. People were jumping out. They were replicating jackass. And oh, they, wow. come, they come around a corner, and they have a buttermeat. Well, they tried to have a buttermeat look alike. They didn't hire the right guy, in my opinion. But um, it but, but it paid tribute to you, which was pretty cool. And, of course, oh. that's when Johnny Knoxville lost it, because we all know what happened when Johnny Knoxville met Butterbean. <laughs> Busted him. <laughs> Great Didn't moment. go well. Great Somebody, sometimes those jackasses were too crazy. I mean, the new movie I hear is crazy again. They do some things. My, my daughter saw it, and she said that. I mean, the things they still do, it's, it's pretty amazing. And, 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 and they're getting old, part, you know. The most part right now, they're all drug-free. <laughs> wow. So this is and they're still doing it. <laughs> You, you you never would thought that Johnny Knoxville would, would still be alive and going. He's getting old too. You you saw him, but um, oh, yeah. you know I me, me and Roddy Piper trained Johnny Knoxville for his WWE the match he did uh, twenty years ago, and he was freaking out meeting Roddy Piper, and he, everything we showed him to do he did at ten times the speed. And he's like, oh my god, he wow. goes. You, you pro wrestlers are, are, are crazy. And I look at this guy, I go, dude, I don't think I've ever said this to anybody, but you are crazier than any pro wrestler I ever met. Talk about a fucking animal. Oh, my God. This guy was yeah. uh, this guy was off the chain. It was really That's something. Beast. That's a big thing got, saying, man, because. Thoughts. Yeah, but, but if you're saying big crazier than pro wrestlers, because like me, I told this before, I started doing pro wrestling in Japan also for New Japan. And in the first three matches, I already had injuries. My wife would say after the third match, she says, go back to real fighting. You never had these injuries that you have now. <laughs> it was crazy. These, I, they were insane. I mean, Scott Steiner and all these guys, and his brother. Dude, I mean, the things they did, and the stories, the stories you heard. I mean, I don't even if I can say stories, but uh, if I even can say it, I mean, 
you you go that straight out of a movie script. Like you go like I do not want to be there at that moment. Like people just start shooting suddenly in the hotel in the in the, in the ceiling, you know, or waking up with an, uh, with someone. Like it's not funny, but it's like it's insane, and that's why it makes it funny. But it's really not funny situation. But there's that girl who overdosed in the room, and they slept for two days straight, and then they smell something, and they realize there's somebody dead in the freaking room. And I go like, dude. This is the most insane thing I've ever heard. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, back in the old days, it was kind of wild. Yes. And 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 doing it 220 shows a year. And that's and that's a low number for these guys. That's without traveling. And then yeah. you listen to guys like your Stone Cold Steve Austin because they pay you 50 bucks, right? And he had to go from show to show in his car, buys a big bag of potatoes, and he would eat those potatoes raw. While he would go to the next show and do and perform there, and all these guys were doing that, and we only know the big names, but all the ones you know as well as I do, Rick. I mean, that's got to be, I mean, the level that makes it what is a five percent compared to all oh, the other. Yeah, guys. not 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 even, and yeah, and boss, you said fifty bucks. Fifty bucks would have been a good payoff back in those days. A lot wow. of it was twenty dollars, and and boss is describing it exactly right. Uh, in, in the height of WWF's days, before they changed to WWE, when, when they would sometimes run two shows a day. So there were actually guys working 400-plus matches a year with big drives in between. But the lower card guys who would follow around and just trying to get in the business, these are the ones that you're talking about. $20 sometimes, they get to an arena, they have to help put the ring up. Oh, so wow. They're, they're, they're part of the ring crew. Then they go work their match. They get the shit beaten out of them because that back in the day it was like that's how they broke wrestlers in. It was a whole different world then. Yeah. They beat the hell out of you to see if you're tough, and then you drive to the next town, put the ring up again, get the shit beat out of you again, get paid your twenty bucks, and go crash in the back of your car with your potatoes or your tuna fish. That was a lot. Twenty bucks included travel money. Wow. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They got yeah. four guys to a car, five guys to a car. If they got a motel room, it'd be all the guy. You can imagine five giant, stinky pro wrestlers sharing a room night after night, living on tuna fish. That's that's not a, that's, that's Mario right there. Yeah, real. So, yeah. Sam, it sounds glamorous. Did you ever think about being a pro wrestler? I did. I grew up watching it. I was watching wrestling when I was in college. Uh, I transferred from Cal Poly to San Diego State, and I had to sit out a year because of the uh, cherry picking clause. So. I remember every Thursday night watching SmackDown with my 12 pack of uh, Miller High Life. And I mean, it was everything. I remember people coming in my room, like, You're not going to go to the bar. What are you doing in here? I said, I'm watching wrestling. Like, yeah, you're such a little kid. You don't watch wrestling anymore. I was like, Get out of here. These guys are better athletes than you ever dreamed to be. And I mean, it's just, it was fun. It's always been fun. So my, my, um, my grandma used to take my mom and her brothers when uh, they were young. And then I'm going to take my kids as soon as they get a little older. I mean, it's just, it's been the family for forever. And, and you never found your way to a pro wrestling school to try it out. I thought about it, but I just really loved football. It was something about football was the first love. But I mean, I, I was still the same kids at the YMCA trying to move and get in trouble for putting people in DDTs. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. starting to practice in theory. Well, I can safely <laughs> say you made the wise choice, no doubt about it. <laughs> yeah. no doubt. Yeah, what was your highest, like your highest achievement in football to you? What, what meant the most to you? Uh, what meant most to me, I believe, would be um, the first 100-yard game I had. Uh, it was my rookie year, and um, it was it looked like I was getting a lot of playing time because I had David Boston in front of me. And um, he had David Boston, Richie Caldwell, a bunch, a bunch of uh, star players. So it was, I wasn't really getting a lot of playing time my rookie year. But then when I got in the game because uh, David got injured, and um, it was a last-minute thing. I had practiced. I knew the plays, um, knew everything, knew the time for the quarterback. But uh, I just kind of expected not to play receiver. And I remember my coach telling me, he's like, you know, you always be ready. You never know. And I guess he knew something. He just kind of nudged me that day. So I was really excited. Oh, man, if I go in, I know this, and I hope they call this and that, and this would be a good play. And sure enough, I get in there. Uh, Dave is injured, and we're playing Pittsburgh in Pittsburgh. as uh, Sunday night football. And um, I get in there, and I make a hell of a place, get a 100-yard game, uh, rookie year. I was super excited. It was, uh, it was just to know that I got to the NFL – was one thing, but then to get that first hundred yard game and to score a touchdown uh, in the same game was just, it was, it was a high, high point for me. 
I mean, I went on to get Pro Bowls, and we were been in uh, really tough games, playing tough opponents. But I think that was just the okay. Now you you proved yourself that you're good enough to be here. Now let's just stay here. But I think that uh, got I got there to that point, and it made me, it really made me proud of myself. Wow, man. So what what's the next chapter of your life look like? Where, where do you see yourself five years and ten years from now? Uh, right when I retired, I got into acting. Uh, I took a year to do interning uh, behind the scenes, sort of learning how the camera works, being on set, um, just protocols, like, you know, how, how the structure happens. And uh, I just wanted to become a better actor myself. And um, it's helped me not only in, in for professional, but also in my personal life. Uh, I have an acting coach. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Glenn Morshower. He was uh, Aaron Pierce on uh, the show 24 on Fox. Yep. And he's also uh, the dad and uh, resident. Um, he's a remarkable coach. Uh, he's just a, a great friend of mine as well. And he sort of told me, once you're done with football, you know, you, got, you may have a future in acting if you treat it the way you treat football. So yeah. um, just, you know, right now I have young kids as well. So balancing the two, I put my kids first before the career. So the career is moving a little slower, but rightfully so, because I want to be there for my kids to give them that encouragement that I didn't have, because I think it's, it's pivotal to get them that, that head start in life uh, and have a good, good footing. So um, I've been doing a lot of dad duty. So I, in, in five years, I see myself as the head of the PTA, the head coach of the football team, head coach of the women's basketball team, and also running up for dad of the year. And, <laughs> and, 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 and accepting your Oscar all at the same time. Yes. And luckily I'm bald, so I'm just going to make an Oscar. <laughs> I'll lay that boss. <laughs> Father of the Year Award. I got one right here. Solid yeah, gold. See, it's a real thing. It's a real thing. <laughs> That's well. Look, I, I, we're um, we're we're running uh, late on our time. Uh, so you you have these great role models in your in your brothers. Even though your dad wasn't there, you um, you had great coaching, and you you talked about the value of that. If there's a kid in back in Salinas right now watching this, and let's say he doesn't have the brothers that you had, he's on his own, and he he's he's on the edge. What what could that kid go do to have a chance to turn it around? I say just, um, well, first off, you have to be honest with yourself. See what's your tries, what's your passion, what motivates you, what, what really gets your blood going. What is something that's hindering you right now from being happy? You have to identify that. And if it's yourself, you have to be real with yourself and say, I'm not happy because I'm not seeing where my blessings are. So recognizing your blessings, understanding that your situation is unique to you. So don't feel like somebody's going to come and tell you every answer you need because it's not going to work that way. You're going to have to figure out where to pull the information to be your own answer. And on top of that, look to the people who've done it. Whatever you want to do, look to whoever's done it already. And then you ask them if you have the chance to ask them or you do your research online, find out how they got there. What was their pitfall? Who were their hangups? Um, there was a time for transitioning from football uh, to losing that and losing sort of part of my identity, but not all of it. I knew where I wanted to go after football, but you have to know what's your exit strategy. Because I kind of let my exit strategy catch up on me before I was able to jump on top of that. And I, I, I was drinking a lot and just kind of down on myself and, and kind of upset that I wasn't where I thought I should be. So I had to reassess, you know, what drove me, what's my post, my passions, motivations, and who did it before me and how did they transition and sort of pick their brain. Um, I've, I've become really good friends with Terry Crews, and he transitioned from football to acting. He's done a phenomenal job. Uh, guys like Akbar Baja Villamilla, who's on The View now, Transition. He was my teammate in college, and now he's uh, in Hollywood, uh, you know, influencing people in a positive way. I think he's a great guy. Uh, just asking these guys questions. I've never always been humble, so you know, I'm never the one to say I know everything. So I'd ask anybody that I think I can value some information from them. I'm just going to ask them the question. If they know the answer, they'll say, "Yeah, you know, here it is." And if they don't know, they'll say, "You know, I don't know." But at least I try. So I'm always really willing to learn. Uh, really honest with myself. I try to figure out what my passions, motivation, and desires are, and then I find who did it before me and try to mirror, mirror that path that pathway. Very cool. Very Very good. Good. Yeah. Did um and, and again I've I said thank you for that. I said a moment ago we are we are past our time, but now I have to ask this too. So you brought up you were you were drinking a lot, and I'm sorry to focus in on that, but I have to ask. Oh, yeah. did, did you have what, what a lot of people would call a rock bottom? Or did you not quite uh, sink that low then? Yeah, that that was a that was a bottom moment because I I got married right after I retired as well. So I not only was like going through losing part of my identity as a football player and losing the spotlight playing on the team, I lost my locker room, my guy camaraderie. Now I have the woman in my life that I have to treat as I did football and put her first. 
And I was still trying to chase after getting back into football and being the football guy that I was letting my marriage neglect. And then I'm arguing, fighting with her. It's unsettled at home. Uh, we had just lost a baby, too, uh, during the placental abruption. So now we're blaming, I'm blaming myself. Was it me that I stressed her out? All these different factors that, you know, you start to overthink yourself. And I'm just uh, looking back at myself. And like I said, I'm very honest with myself. And I was disappointed at where I was. I said, you know, I should be doing this. So I've always been prided myself on doing that. Now I'm procrastinating. Now I'm distracted. I've never been that way. That, that right there would get you cut in football. And I've been allowed it to creep in. And then I started to feel sorry for myself. And then I just found comfort in drinking because it would numb it. And all it did was push the, the rock down the road. I mean, I haven't had to deal with it when I get sober. You can't be drunk forever. Or you're going to end up like some of my friends who have not made that transition properly. And I mean, it's a real thing. You know, you, you do damage and you get out and you lose part of your identity. You lose your locker room. Now you got to go and face the world. And there's not really a good transition program for guys like us to get out. Neither is there for military. I think it's worse for military, like phenomenally worse military. That transition program, that locker room, that team, they need that team, the guys in the barracks, to sort of rally behind and say, I, I'm going with you. I walked this walk with you. Let's do it together. I mean, you just kind of get thrown out on the street and it's like, yeah, you'll figure it out. You got money. You played football before. You're not know figured out. And it's sort of, I, I missed that. Hey, I got it figured out. I know I do. Now let's, let's make it happen. You know, real life happens and kind of, I let it catch up rather than staying ahead of it. And then, and so, then you know, I was using alcohol too. What was your, what was your turnaround point or your epiphany to put you back on the right path? Uh, my wife told me that I wasn't communicating anymore properly, that I became more of an angry drunk, that I was getting uh, frustrated. And she said that I used to see you partying, you'd be the happy guy. Now you drink and you're a little angry and upset and hairpin triggers. You never used to be that way. You're not sleeping well, you're snoring a lot, and you're slurring your speech, and you're not forming sentences properly the way you used to. And she's like, basically telling me that I'm, I'm dumbing down, so to speak, and becoming more barbaric and brute. She said, maybe you should get your brain checked. So I went to the brain check center in San Diego, and uh, the guy, Bob, is a former Navy SEAL. He says, yeah, you know, the frequency in the front's not matching the one in the back. Long story short, you hit your head too many times. We can fix you, put you on this magnet, send you on your way. You'll be happy again. And I thought it was remarkable that my wife picked up on that and stood firm, said, this is the problem. You need to fix it. And she sort of reached out again. And again, it's never been about me. It's always been the people that have been around me that have been really awesome people who have loved me. So thankfully, I've not done enough damage to lose that love. And she reached out and said, let's go get you better. And I mean, once my brain started firing again, I started getting my motivations back, started feeling like myself again. And I mean, I, I attribute it to, to the Brain Treatment Center that they just they got me that, that jump start to get me back going. What, what really happened, Rick, his wife said, if you don't straighten your shit up, I'm going to call your mama. <laughs> the, of the, the butter bean breakdown, where he breaks down people sophisticated talking to dance on the subject. I'm just going to cut straight to the chase. Why well, say you don't show up? You can chip you out, <laughs> dude. That's fantastic. I, I I I have a friend going through it right now. I hope you heard this. Thank you for that, man. That was oh, yeah. uh, going through exactly what you described. A good friend of all of ours. So good. To, so good to hear your story, man. And and Kasim and Butterbean and Boss. Such a pleasure for me to sit here and watch three legends, three universal legends at the top of the world. Who have been at the top and are at the top again, man. It's really gratifying to see that. So thanks, uh, thank all three of you for being here. And thank you, Rick, for guiding us through this whole thing. Great question, brother. Yeah. Every Any man that kicks cash ass is a legend in my book. So you're a legend right there with the best of them. There you go. Well, you guys, that guys, so such a great, uh, such a great hour, hour and ten minutes, as the case may be. Uh because, Sam, I have a feeling that we'll be calling upon you again, my friend. And uh, hopefully uh, you'll be up for answering that call again. Hey, I got perfect service, so I'm, I'm, I'm always open. Awesome. <laughs> I love it. Well, man, hey, I want to wish all three of you the best week ever. And uh, fantastic seeing you this evening. And uh, I think it's time to let everybody go because we are past our time. Big thanks to... Uh, our producers, Rachel Sartoris, who did an amazing job as always. And thanks you, thank you to John Paz, who I know is out there as well. So signing off from Boss, where are you? California, Westlake Village, Ventura County. And Bean, Jasper, Alabama. Sam, Jasper, Azusa. Alabama. Yeah, I'm in I'm in Azusa, AZ USA. Woo. <laughs> Jasper, myself on, on Maui, 
Uh, we want to wish you all a great night and a great week. And we're signing off from Talking Tough.